Welcome, welcome to To The Point. Very interesting program today. We're going to be talking about the New Testament church. Now, I'm not an expert at the New Testament church, but I've got a very close friend called Chris Wickland, who is, and he actually is pastoring two churches, so he jolly well ought to know what he's talking about. Let me introduce you to straight away to Pastor Chris Wickland. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. That's okay. It's nice to be on the show again, Richard. Uh, firstly, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on uh, the New Testament church. I'm kind of finding my way uh, <laughs> on New Testament church the hard way, but yeah, I'm getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> okay. Well, look, let's um, start with the biblical model. What do you believe is the biblical model for a New Testament <coughs> church? Well, I mean, a long time ago, just before I uh, planted the Fairham Church, uh, God was very good to me. He, before, before I knew I was going to be planting a church, he started speaking to me very gently. And I was listening to a lot of sermons on my iPhone that were just sort of things that I was just picking at random. And they were all the same kind of thing. It was all about church planting and, and uh, these pastors, how that God spoke to them about certain passages of Scripture. And one uh, fundamental passage that kept coming through, which has really been for me amazing, um, which is from Acts 2, chapter 2, verses 41 on. And it says, um, Then they that gladly received uh, the word were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, so there's one point, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. So there's several things there. They, they, they devoted themselves to, to teaching, uh, to fellowship, meeting with one another, breaking of bread, so the, the idea of communion was quite important, um, and prayer. Mm. You know, so they were, they were intrinsic to the, sort of the early church. Um, then it says in verse 44, And all that believed uh, were together and had all things in common, that's commonly not taught in most churches these days. You know, we pay all our, our tithes or our offerings to the church, but we don't, there's not many churches that would say, okay, right, this is, this is the melting pot of money. Who is in need? Let's, let's help you guys out as like a common purse, if you like. Um, and it says in verse 46, this is quite key, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat them their food with gladness and singleness of heart. And it's kind of there where I, I, I kind of figured out what, which way we should be going. Because I mean, when, I, when I felt that God was saying, right, it's time for you to plant a church, I got these books on church planting, mm. and all these different people, and I read all these different types of models, you know, from mega church just to little house churches. And, and by the time I'd gone through all these books and been a good student and done all my homework, I was more confused than ever. I was just in a complete... I had some, had some friends come over and pray for me. because I was like, I just don't know what to do. And, um, you know, I just wanted to get it right. But then I kind of realized that actually church adapts and evolves depending on where it is because church is a living thing. It's organic. Yes. So it will grow and it will take on the form as it grows depending on who's in it and location and things like that. Mm. But it was really that, that this verse here, it says how they continued daily with one accord in the temple. Mm. So firstly, that for me was basically saying, okay, you still need your kind of Sunday morning service, what I call church, shop front of a church, if you like, because the actual Sunday morning service isn't church per se. That's where we come together. Uh, we, we have corporate worship. We, we break bread and we um, listen to the teaching, the word and things like that and, uh, and take that away. But then after that, it says how that they then... Uh, broke bread from house to house and that kind of then spoke to me about the importance of home groups house groups and that actually for me is is where the real lifeblood of the church is because hmm. there that people could operate in in body ministry uh where people can you know people can sort of start walking into their into their giftings their callings we can share things uh, a lot of pastoral care can be done there you know this idea of this one guy who's on you know, he's got like the bat phone for all pastoral care. It's just, it's just crazy. Why, why would anybody want to put themselves in a place where they are the man at the top of the pyramid and they're the man with the bat phone so anyone's got a problem is going to ring up that pastor? And I'll tell you something that's going to happen to that pastor. He's going to burn himself out. <laughs> and so if you can get everyone in the church, um, you know, within, within the context of home groups and relationship, just to be there and help each other, that takes mm. a lot of the burden away. Mm. So that when you do get the odd phone call on the bat phone, it's generally people that really, you know, really need some help. Mm. So that, that was kind of, uh, kind of one of the things. And the whole issue of, of breaking of bread, I felt that that was really important as well. I know 
some churches they have communion every week and other churches maybe have it once every few months or once a year or whatever but for when we planted the, the Ferrum church I just really felt that it was everything had to be about Jesus mm. and so constantly reminding ourselves about what Jesus did for us on the cross was was a sobering thing and a good thing and uh, and that's why we have communion ev every week so yeah that that was kind of like how we started with with the church model that was where it kind of started and then it's sort of grown from there really mm. Well, now, you, you've, you actually planted the church in Fairham, am I right, about two years ago, yep, Chris? Yep, right, yep. Uh, I need to tell viewers this is the church that I go to. It's actually, there are actually two churches, and I have a very close friend called Roger, who was the pastor of the other church, which you've now taken over. Yeah. So you've actually planted one church and taken over another church. Yeah, so... Wow. Yeah, so I come out of Cosham, planted in Fairham, and I've gone back to Cosham as well and sort of... And taken over the other church. That, yeah. So... Two questions, really. Yeah. First of all, how did you find past, uh, planting the church in Fairham? And secondly, how did you find taking over a, somebody else's church? Well, when you plant a church, you've kind of got a blank canvas. <laughs> and you can pretty much, you know, within a remit, do what you like. Yeah. You know, you can say, right, this is what I want to do. This is what I believe God is saying. And then you develop a culture in that church and, and, and so on and so forth. That's, that's fine. But the, the, when I then moved and started helping out with Kosham and then I was asked to take it over, that, that, was, that was a real challenge because you, you can't just go into someone else's church where there is a culture that's already established, where they have their way of doing things, mm. where you've got people of varying different ages and they do things differently from, from other congregations and stuff. You just can't go in there with your <laughs> machine gun and just start <laughs> blowing the heck out of everything, changing everything and stuff. And so the, the first thing I realised I had to do was, for myself, jam on the brakes and just stop and think, actually, you know, what is the culture of this church? Um, mm. You know, what's the good things about this church? And, and what are the things that maybe need to be changed and stuff? So, and I've been running Kosham now for about, uh, God, it must be six months nearly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's only now that I feel like I can maybe sort of start bringing in a couple of changes. But it, it was a real challenge emotionally. It was, it was very difficult taking over someone else's church. Um, you know, it's not something I would, I'd particularly like to do again if I <laughs> if I had the <laughs> choice, but I, I did believe it was the right thing, and I believe it was God, God's timing and stuff yeah. as well. But it was it, it was quite difficult for me, um, mm. and it's it's very intimidating as well. If I'm honest with you, you've got uh, particularly in the Koshim congregation, there's a lot of older people there, yeah. and some of these older people they know their Bible, and um, <laughs> so you get up there and preach, and then afterwards you get some of these old guys come up to you and say, well. I really enjoyed your sermon, but there was probably a couple of bits here you need to be aware of. And that really challenged me. It's like, I, if I'm going to preach to these guys, I really, <laughs> really need to do my homework. I need to look in my Greek and I need to look in my Hebrew so that I don't get caught like that again. And it's good. So it's made me sharper, a bit, bit wiser. Um, but at the same time, I'm unapologetic in my style. The, you know, Koshim's got a very good history of good Bible teaching. Yes. Um, and that's a heritage and a history that I'd like to continue. But I have a different kind of style in a sense that I like to take the truth of Scripture, point it to Jesus and make it relevant to us for now. And, 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 and there's a response to that as well and make it a bit more challenging and, and say, you know, are we really going to press into the things of Jesus? Are we really going to walk in our relationship with him? Are we going to press into the things of holiness and just really just press into God and press into his word and, and just seek him and pray and, and pray for the lost and things, you know, just, just get really serious about what mm. we're here for, you know. Mm. So, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. And I, 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 well, I would be terrified to do what you have done. So first of all, my congratulations. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and I do think you're doing a wonderful job, Chris, if I may say so. Thank you. Um, I imagine it has its sort of ups and downs. Uh, I, I don't know if it has or hasn't. I would hate to be a pastor of a church because it's just not sort of the thing I like to do. But anyway, it, it must be a very difficult thing on occasions. It is. Um, it's, uh, I almost see it as in two week bursts. I get two weeks where it's great, <laughs> two weeks where it's not so great, and then two weeks where it's like, why am I doing this job? <laughs> and, um, yeah. But it's, it's, when it's something that God calls you to do, yeah. it's, even to most people, they wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. But uh, some people might. Some people might want to do it because their motivations, they want to have some kind of power. And when you become a pastor, 
and, uh, and I believe using the biblical model, you realize that actually that's not how, what it's about at all. You know, Jesus says, um, you shall not lord it over them like the Gentiles do. Mm. So spiritual authority in the church is not a place of, I tell you what to do and you do as I say, and that's absolutely not it at all. You know, it's, it's um, we are, as leaders, you're responsible for mm. people and you're held accountable to God. And in some ways, it's not fair because the, 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 you know, other Christians who are not in leadership aren't held to that account that I am. You know, so they could go off and do their own crazy thing and I could appeal yeah. to them as like, I'm not listening to you, but I'm the one that's still held accountable for it. So it's a really awkward job sometimes. Um, and, mm. uh, but, I, but I absolutely love it. And I'm really passionate about growing church, planting church. And uh, you know, Ephesians 4, it talks about the fivefold ministry the apostle, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, evangelists and stuff. And they are there to bring the saints to the fullness of the maturity of the stature of Christ. Mm. Why? So that those Christians in turn can go out and do things that they have been called to do as well. Mm. You know, some churches have a bottleneck where it all comes to those at the top of the pyramid. It's like the pastor and the, and the, and the elders and stuff. And that's absolutely not how it should be. Right. So, you know, a standard uh, philosophy in church structures, you have the pyramid structure where you have the, the seat of power at the top and then gradually it goes down to, the, to, to all the minions down below. And it's, <laughs> it's absolutely, that's a worldly philosophy. That's a very worldly approach yeah. to church and it's wrong. I think the godly approach to uh, biblical leadership is not so much a pyramid, but a, a hump, you know, in the sense that for the most part, we're all here serving one another, but the role of leadership is to uh, teach, console, bring people on, help them come to maturity, watch over them, oversee them in that respect, overseeing as in looking after them, you know, not telling them what to do, mm. as it were. I mean, you can, you know, if, if people are in error, you, all you can do at the end of the day is, you know, you could say, well, look, this is what I believe the Bible is saying, and this is what I think God's best is for you. But that, at the end of the day, is all you can do, really, and it's up to them whether they want to listen to you or not. Yeah. So for, for me, so biblical leadership is not so much about uh, that, but rather more about that, mm. you know, so we're all in it together. And you know, it talks about in Corinthians 12 and 13 about the gifts to mm. the church. Mm. And it, this, isn't, this isn't for, you know, the gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits, uh, administrations and things like that. These, these are not leadership gifts. These are gifts for anyone mm. as the Holy Spirit wills to give them out. Mm. And, and, and sadly, I don't see this evidence in, in many churches and and so as a leadership you need to try and encourage that to happen and you mm. kind of need to you know keep it balanced and stuff but you need to try and encourage mm. people to move out and step out into those things because there is a subtle difference and this is why I say there's kind of like a blip like a mold a, a, mm. a mound rather than you know like a straight line is because there's two types of gifts in Ephesians 4 it talks about the gifts of Christ and in Corinthians 12 and 13, it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm. But there is a difference. See, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given out to all. Mm. Yeah. But the gifts of Christ are slightly different in that it's as much the gift as it is the person that, uh, that God has chosen to put the gift upon. Mm. Yeah. So mm. the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit can be given out to anybody. But when Jesus brings gifts of Christ to the church, it is as much the individual that is brought into that place of leadership as well as the anointing or, or, the, or the gifting on top. So there is a subtle difference. So that's why there's kind of like that sort of lump. It's not that we're any better than any, you know, being a spiritual leader is, means that you're better than anyone else because it doesn't. You know, any wisdom that we have, anything that God gives us so we can impart to other people comes from the Holy Spirit. Mm. And it's, you know, it's not because we're clever or I'm clever or anything like mm. that. It's just, it's all of God. It's all of God. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his kingdom, building his church. And I'm not into empire building, but I'm into kingdom building. That's well, what Which I'm is very about. powerful. And I have to say, I think you're doing a wonderful job, Chris, if I may say so. Thank you. Now, two areas I want to um, go into. One is, uh, uh, first of all, what type of um, elders, if you like, or leadership qualities do you like amongst the people around you? And the other one I want to talk about is evangelism, what your plans are for evangelism, what you're already doing, and yeah. how you see that progressing. So spend a bit of time talking about one and the other, whichever way you like. Okay, well, with leaders, um, again, you know, 
when when you when you plant something and you've never done it before you kind of you know you, you make mistakes and you do things so I mean now having looked at things uh, from a deeper perspective you know I like a, a leader not necessarily but would help if they were a good teacher but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to um, but also you know they need to have a servant heart they need to be there um, helping people meeting with people ho having hospitality with people and and not because they're in a position of leadership but because that's just the pe their, their, their their nature you know they want to be there early and they want to set up stuff for help for the church and you know, all the practical things that isn't glorious mm. you know it's not like hey i'm up at the front and i'm preaching the gospel and i'm amazing it's not about that it's about serving having a good heart being there for people and also controversially i believe that a leader should be someone who gives generously generously financially as well mm. um, because you know you have to lead by example and if you're not leading by example then i don't think you should be a leader at all you know yeah. it's just as simple yeah. as that as far as i'm concerned so that's that's yeah. kind of the qualities that i look for in leadership I know one of the things you said is you're, you're constantly seeking people who want to serve the Lord and not particularly to promote themselves and yeah. are not looking for a particular position. They just want to be part of the body of Christ. And one of the things I've, I'm a member of uh, Chris's ch church, and uh, one of the things I feel sort of very much about it is like a sort of family, isn't it? Yeah. Um, one of our church members likes to often calls us the band of brothers <laughs> because it is like a sort of band of brothers and I have to say Revelation TV is very similar actually um, everyone is friends um, and we have some uh, lovely viewers and they send us lovely emails and we feel that the family out there are just one big family we're all in this thing together <laughs> and that's how I feel at, uh, at your church Chris. Yeah, good I mean that's what we want to try and encourage is a is a family environment and just let people Obviously, it's, things are done in order, but let people do things that they feel that they're called to do. And eventually, you start getting lots of pockets of activity and things going mm. on, and, and, and it just becomes organic, and it just grows into what which it is becomes, the best way. Which, is, which is great. And everybody's encouraged. I find people get frustrated when they're not doing what they're called to do. Yeah. You know? And uh, if you hold people back, that will cause problems for yourself and for other people as well. Yeah, you're yeah. right. So let's now talk about evangelism. Now, there is actually quite a lot going on. Perhaps you could tell the viewers all about that. Um, yeah, we have a guy, I think he was on the show uh, some time ago, called Mark Reed. He's, uh, he's our uh, evangelist, if you like, and obviously you do a lot of evangelism work as well. So we do a lot of things out on the streets. Um, and that's, that's, that's okay. That's, that's, that's one thing that we do. And another thing that we've been doing is um, we had this guy he sort of turned up for a little while at our church and then he said, you know what you need to do? He said, because right next to where our church building is, there's this big hostel and it's basically full of, uh, you know, what you would consider down and outs and stuff. And it's where the social uh, services of, of Fairham just kind of dump them all. And so that there's all these people in there. And he was like, why don't you put it on a Christmas meal for these, for these guys, you know, get them into the church and stuff. And I was like, yeah, sounds a good idea. I said, can you, do you want to sort of help take this on and stuff? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get on with it. And then he just vanished. Just <laughs> poof, gone. And uh, I haven't seen him ever since. And um, so we were like, okay, well, we've got to do this now. So we did it. And then from doing that, that gave us contact with these people next door. And, and they came to the Christmas meal and they really enjoyed it, really appreciated it. And ever since then, what we do now is when we realized in how, what dire straits they were in, we go over there each week giving them food and, and things like that. Mm. And, uh, and, and through that now, we, you know, I've been able to chat with people, pray with them. Uh, we've, led some, we've led three of them to the Lord. Um, you know, and out of, out of those three, we've got one particular guy now who's just coming to church all the time now, you know, and, and God's really come through for him. He's taken him out of that place. Uh, he's now got his own home and stuff and, you know, mm. getting it all kitted out mm. and things. And he's going on with God, you mm. know, and it's, it's just, just great to see. But you have mm. to invest time with these people. You can't just, it doesn't just happen by magic. You know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of prayer and just keep on giving and giving without expecting it something in return. Yeah. You know, there's no, no, no strings attached, as it were, mm. you know. So that's another thing that, that we've been doing, and that's been quite successful as well. So, Actually, I, I am, in a little way, involved with this, actually. It is actually uh, very humbling, actually, to go over see some actually very poor people living yeah. in caravans and very poor accommodation, and to give them uh, orange bags from the supermarkets uh, with just simple food, and they're absolutely delighted, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Means and to just them. become friends with them. Uh, there, there seems to be two types of evangelism, really, because we do go out on the streets and we just um, talk to people in the streets for a few minutes and then 
that's it. But then there's the other type of evangelism, which is what you might call friendship evangelism, yeah, yeah. which actually probably is more effective. Yeah. But yeah, I think yeah, you need to have both. I think you do. I mean, um, probably in a couple of months' time, I want to sort of sit down and, and strategize more ideas and stuff so that we can you know, really start uh, doing things, you know, just practical things like um, when you get a visitor that comes and meets you on a Sunday morning, don't just let them go off, but maybe arrange to have a coffee with them and just chat with them and see yeah. where they're coming from and share with them the vision of the church and stuff. And that's, that's a very useful way of um, sort of growing the church as well. Although you might people some say, well, you know, it's not a numbers game. You know, you're not, you're not into church planting and stuff to, for numbers' sake. But no, I'm not. But the way I see it is that every number that's on a chair is someone who isn't going to hell, that's someone that's being a disciple of Christ, and that's someone who could be the next church planter, could mm -hmm. be the next preachers, can be the next people that are doing all kinds of things, entering into the good works that were prepared for them before the foundation of the earth, as the good book says. You know, and it's important that we enable people to, to do those things and to make them grow up mature in Christ so that they can do those things. Well, it seems to be doing, making a great success of it so far. And um, personally, I'm very happy <laughs> uh, to come along. And uh, there are a lot of children there as well. You've got a children's ministry. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, come about quite good. We, although the Fair and Plant is a relatively small church, it's got lots of kids. Yeah. Lots, lots and lots of kids. And... Um, yeah, so we, from pretty much from day one, were landed with a Sunday school problem. I mean, you know, if you go back to the church in Acts, you know, we don't think about this, but 3,000 people got saved in one day. Mm. So they went from a little church of 120 in an upper room to suddenly there's 3,000 people. And what are you going to do with all these people? <laughs> and so we had, we had this problem where, you know, my poor old wife was burning herself out trying to do a Sunday school. But we've now got this uh, a guy called Alex and... And uh, he's come up with this just clever idea where he's getting the older, younger ones to take on a Sunday school in, on like a rotor. And yeah. that they then in turn teach the Sunday school. So they're learning leadership skills. They're learning how to present stuff. But then they're also learning to respect someone who's teaching because they're, they're thinking, actually, it really bugs me when people keep talking when I'm trying to sh share something. So next time when someone's teaching me, I'm just going to be quiet. You know, so it's, it's, mm. it's good all round. Yeah. And uh, Alex is sort of planning on taking that further as well. So, yeah, yeah. so the youth side of things is relatively right. healthy. Two more questions because we've got to wrap up very yeah, yeah, quickly. Sure. Is um, plans for the future? <sighs> plans, about that. plans for the future. Um, there's a few things that uh, by the time that this will go to air, it will be announced. So it's, it's, it's no secret, really. But basically a few things. Um, like with Kosham, we want to sort of invest more financially into her to help her grow more. Um, and so one of the, the things that we're going to try and do is is just pay me one day a week, mm. every week, uh, to, to, to help with that. Because at the moment, the Fairham congregation are sponsoring me, so that allows me to give it, because I'm a, mu a music teacher as, as well, so that get, allowed me to give up all my evening tuition so I could be free. Um, you know, uh, for example, last night I was up till half past 12 just chatting with some non-Christians who phoned me up to come over, and I got a chance to share the gospel with them and things and, uh, and pray for them, and this takes time. It does. And you have to be available. Uh, and, you know, so that's one of the, the plans. And also for Kosham as well is to sort of reinvigorate the whole worship band and stuff as well. Mm. So I've got a few sort of few ideas just to tweak yeah. things and make things run a bit better and yeah. make it more, you know. And uh, finally, any, uh, anybody have got any particular advice for viewers? Uh, anyone who, who's aspiring to be a church pastor or if we, like most of us, are just simply members, how to treat our pastor. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to be a church pa uh, planter, don't do it. <laughs> Get a stacking job at Tesco's, you'll be much happier. No, seriously, if you, if you want to be uh, a church planter, you have to know that you know that you know that you're called to do it. Because I tell you, there'll be some days where you just think, what is the point? Why am I doing this? Because I mean, that's the reality of the situation. There are times where it's a very emotional job to do and it's very mm. difficult, it's very arduous sometimes. And at other times it's, it's just such a privilege to be able to do. So that's one thing I'd say. And uh, as for a congregation treating their pastor, um, you know, there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes than probably they're, they're aware of. You yeah, know, true. you get people that judge you sometimes thinking, you ain't praying enough and you ain't reading your Bible enough. And it's like, actually, you have no idea. You know, I'm praying a lot and I'm reading a lot and I'm studying and pressing into God a lot just because I can't be at every meeting you're at doesn't mean that I'm not pressing into God either, you know. Yeah. So. so probably, uh, this is just a broad thing, but just generally, uh, what, one thing I've learned in my short Christian walk, if you like, is uh, less criticism, more encouragement.
Yeah, definitely, definitely yeah. all round. That's, uh, well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, if you've got any comments, please contact us at uh, info at Revelation TV. If you've got any questions for Chris, I'll certainly pass your questions along. Uh, Chris has got his own website. Come up on the um, come up on the screen, I hope. And he's got an awful lot of teaching from Chris on a whole lot variety of different subjects. And so Chris and I have uh, been very good friends for many years, and uh, I certainly go to his church. I'm very happy there. Um, we hope to have Chris back on television uh, fairly regularly. Um, this is a slightly different program. We hope you enjoyed it. And do give us some feedback. Uh, info at Revelation TV. Chris, thank you for coming. It's been so great it's having been you good on, fun. On, on, on set. And uh, bless, you for, uh, bless you for joining us as well. And you're very much part of Revelation TV. The viewers are what Revelation TV is all about. So bless you.